All right, guys, let's take a look at another one. All right, we're gonna start with our standard question. What land are we in, right? What land are we in? What letter are we using? How many samples do we have? All right, so owners of a very large lake recently stocked the lake with bass and proudly proclaimed that 80% of the bass caught in the lake meet the required 15 inch minimum length. Smaller fish must be thrown back. I'm not sure if you've ever gone fishing before, but if you have, if you catch a fish that's too small, you gotta throw it back in. And the way this lake is set up, it looks like they've gotta be at least 15 inches long, so a little over a foot. And if not, you gotta throw them back in. So at the lake, 10 fishermen caught 51 bass, of which they were allowed to keep 27. Do the fishermen have evidence to show that the lake's proportion of bass that meet the 15 inch minimum length is different from the owner's claim? Okay. Let's see what we got here, right? That's part A, and I'm gonna warn you, you're gonna need a lot of space for this, all right? So first of all, what land am I in? Well, here's the word proportion. So that's a nice giveaway that I'm in proportion land. Maybe you also saw the 80% floating around, right? That's another great indicator that you're in proportion land. So just based off of those two, I'm gonna to go to my margins and I'm gonna type, or not type, I'm gonna write this in. So I know I'm in prop land. I know I'm gonna be looking at a Z test statistic. And I only did one sample. Admittedly, there were 51 fish, but we only ran through this once. It's not like we went there one day and caught some fish and then another day and caught some fish. We did this once. So this is a one sample situation. I also wanna point out the word evidence. As soon as I see evidence, I'm gonna just make a note here, right? Run hype test. This wasn't asking for an estimate. This is, I want some evidence. Is it there or uh, again, do we have it? Do we not have it? Run a hypothesis test. So I know I'm in proportion land. Whenever you're asked to run a hypothesis test, I, whether you're in proportion or mean land, and I get that we're in proportion land this time, um, you will be given two proportions. If you're in mean land, you'll be given two means. But did anyone hear the other proportion living or floating through this problem? Did anyone hear the proportion of 27 out of 51, right? So we've got this other proportion and I'll just put it off to the side here. We've got 27 out of 51. If I crunch that number, let's see what that's equal to. 27, let me clear this out. All of this, 27 out of 51 is about 53%, all right? So let me highlight that so that we're looking at 27 out of 51. And what we need to figure out before we move any further with this is which one was the parameter, which one was the statistic. And I personally always feel it's easier to identify the statistic. It comes from a sample. So if we look at this, which one of these came from the sample? It was right here, right? The sample of 51 bass. So this is my sample proportion. All right, so I'm just gonna keep that in mind and I'm gonna put a pin in that until step 10, right? We don't deal with our statistic until step 10, meaning this one was the parameter. And that's what the lake owners were claiming. They're like, hey guys, come fish at our lake. 80% of our fish are good, right? You're gonna keep them. And these fishermen were like, I don't know, dude, you, maybe you're lying. And I kind of think they are lying, right? 53% is pretty far off from 80%. What's the likelihood that if there were really 80% bass that met the fish length, this required length, what's the likelihood that I'd, I'd have such a rotten day that I would only get 53%? Like, is that possible? Or is that so far off? Is the discrepancy between 80% and 53% so far off that I actually think the owners of the lake are lying? Well, let's go find out. All right, so as we do this, I've got to run a hypothesis test. So we're gonna go through our 10, not 10, JK. We're gonna go through our 13 steps, right? So we're gonna define our parameter. We're in proportion land, so we're talking about P. So we're gonna talk about the true proportion of something. And what are we trying to keep track of? Well, we're trying to keep track of fish that meet the length requirement. So for part A, and again, you're gonna need a lot of space here. So step one, P is the true proportion. And this is the true proportion of bass that meet the minimum length requirement. Okay, 
fantastic. So steps two and three are always ho and ha. All right, so we're gonna figure out what's my null, what's my alternate, and just so that I'm not um, flipping back between the papers too much, again, null, alternate, and alpha level. So we're gonna do all three of those right now. Null, alternate, and alpha level. All right, so as I do this, step two, ho, colon, step three, ha, colon, we're gonna have a P on both of those, equals, and I'll get the symbol in just a moment. All right, so what's the claim? They're claiming 80%. Okay, now, let's read the setup. It says, do the, do the fishermen have evidence to show that the lake's proportion of bass that meet the minimum length requirement is different from the owner's claim? So I wanna take a look at that phrase, different from. All right, that is not slanting me one way or the other. It's not saying it's um, lower than the owner's claim or higher than the owner's claim. It's just saying it's different from. So I'm gonna go with a not equals to. And I mean, I, I, I kinda, I, I know why they're doing it because that's the industry default. We always go to a not equals to. But you could make the argument that the fishermen won't be upset if P was uh, greater than 80%, right? No one's gonna be like, oh my gosh, more fish meet the length requirement. How dare you, right? We'd really be concerned if it was a less than. But based on that, that phrasing, the different from, we're gonna put the not equals to. All right, in terms of an alpha level, I did not give you an alpha level, right? I intentionally didn't. So we're gonna to go to the industry standard of 5%, okay? Again, industry standard, it's good, right? They use it out in the real world all the time. Okay, so the next thing we have to do is check our assumptions, all right? We've checked assumptions a good chunk of times in chapters seven and eight. We're gonna keep on doing it for the rest of the semester. So here we go, assumptions. The first one is, did I have a random sample? All right, did I get a random sample of bass? Let's see. Or it could say sample represents population. All right, let's find out. This one just says, at the lake, 10 fishermen caught 51 bass. So I have no mention of whether or not this was a random sample. And you can imagine how hard it would be to actually get a random sample of fish. Like, how do you go to a lake assign each fish a number, pull out your TI-84 calculator, see which ones you want to include in your sample and then go get them. It's really hard to do that. Um, in fact, I would argue it's probably impossible and that's fine. I, I don't even know how I would bias myself if I was um, trying to do this uh, just without a random sample. So I haven't met this assumption and I'm okay with that. Again, this one isn't the deal breaker. The deal breaker is the normality assumption, right? We got to get on that normally distributed sampling distribution. So what's NP and N1 minus P? Okay, and now with this, again, sometimes there's a confusion. Do I use the 80% or the 53%? We'll go back to which one do you assume is true? We're assuming the 80% is true, right? You assume the null is true unless you have evidence for the alternate. And the evidence from the alternate always comes from your, your sample data, but we're not going to use this until step 10. So you set up your assumptions based on what you're assuming to be true, right? Assumptions, assuming. All right, so here we go. We had 51 bass. I'm supposed to assume that 80% meet the minimum length requirement. And then let's try its complement and see what we're getting. So I'm gonna head over to my calculator. We're gonna go 51 times 0.8. Looks like it was 40.8, okay? So I will put 40.8 which is greater than or equal to 10. All right, and then let's do its complement. So 51 times one minus 0.8 is 10.2. So I'm just scooching in there. Um, greater than or equal to 10, but I got it. Hello. All right, here we go. So this is saying that if I had a random sample, or I, I guess not, I shouldn't say random, we didn't have it, but if I had a sample of 51 bass, I expect to see almost 41 fish that meet the length requirement. What did I actually see? You see it's down at 27, right? That's a pretty solid discrepancy. It's making me think, dude, the alternate's probably true. So I should have seen about 41 fish, or technically 40.8 fish, meeting the minimum length requirement and 10.2 fish not meeting the minimum length requirement. And if we just take a moment, right, 40.8 plus 10.2 gets us to 51, it should, right? Successes, failures. And that should always total out to your sample size. 
All right, now we need sample size small relative to my population. So let me go ahead, I'm just gonna do this off to the side here. If I take 51 and I multiply it by 10, I'm looking at 510 bass. Now, I don't know for sure how many fish are in that length, excuse me, in that lake, but I'm gonna take a gamble on this one. Right? I don't think it's too crazy of an assumption to say they, they put at least 500 fish into that length. I keep saying length, 500 fish into that lake. So I'm gonna go ahead and make the leap of faith that my sample size is small relative to my population. I'm okay with that, all right? All right, so step six. This is tell me what distribution you are on. So if we go back to our steps, right, we're gonna tell me this, the name of the distribution. I either say Z or T, but I'm in proportion land, so I'm gonna say Z distribution, okay? I'm gonna state the name of the test. All right, so sample, land, letter, and then I want to state degrees of freedom. Okay, so let's let's do this one at a time. So step six, it looks like I'm going to say Z distribution. You could also write standard normal distribution. I'm fine either way. All right. Step seven is a little bit longer in terms of writing it out. All right. So that one is state the name of your test. So again, how many samples? What land are you in? What letter are you using? We have one sample. We are in proportion land, and we are using the Z test statistic. So I am doing a one sample proportion. Actually, I should put this here, proportion. Z hypothesis test. Step eight is degrees of freedom, and we've said it before, but when you're in proportion land, there are no degrees of freedom, so this is not applicable. Okay, so we're almost done with our setup. All right, I'm gonna scoot this up. So step nine is to actually go get that test statistic with just the formula. So let's take a look at the formula. All right, we got value minus mean over standard deviation, or stat minus parameter over standard error. So I'm gonna copy this formula right onto my paper. So step nine is Z will equal P prime minus P square root P one minus P over N. There we go. All right, step 10, fill in my numbers for my particular problem. All right, we said our sample proportion was 53%. We, we know our null proportion is 80. So I'm gonna go 80, 80, 80 here. And our sample size was 51. Okay, so I'm gonna say, what was my sample proportion? Yeah, 53. My null was 80. And I'm gonna go square root of 80, one minus 80, over 51. Okay, so again, you're gonna take a leap of faith with me for this problem, and then we will do this on our calculator, but just trust me that when you do this, you get negative 4.83. And I want you to think about where negative 4.83 lives on the standard normal distribution. Think about that graph, okay? All right, so I'm gonna draw the graph. I'm gonna do step 12 first, and then I'm gonna come back around and explain step 11. Because this is our first time doing a not equals to test, so I wanna do the graph first. So let me make a graph for step 12, and then we will come back around and pick up step 11. All right, oh, I found my ruler. All right, got it. Oops, let me get this back in view. There we go, okay. I think I knocked it out of whack. I am having a good time getting this all on the right view screen. Okay. So let me draw my graph. And I'll put just a little bit more of the z-axis in there. Okay. So as we go through this, right, we know this is the z-axis. Zero is under the peak. I want you to think about negative 4.83. Right? It's going to be, this is like negative 1, negative 2, negative 3. It's going to be over here somewhere. Negative 4.83. Okay. And I want you to think about how much area is to the left of that. Just start to visualize what that talks about. 
All right, so now let's talk about the p-value through a graph, okay? All right, so here's the rule, and keep in mind we had a not equals to alternate, okay? When you have a not equals to alternate, you have to decide was your number in step 10 positive or negative? Let's look back, okay? So our number in step 10 was negative. So if z is negative, which it is, find the area to the left of z and double it for symmetry. Okay, so what this is saying is if you had a less than test, right? and I know we have a not equals to, but if we had a less than test, we would go to the left here, right? And there's almost no area. But a two-sided test, it includes not just the less than, but the greater than version. And through symmetry, positive 4.83 is over here, and the area under the curve right of uh, 4.83 is the same as the area under the curve to the left of negative 4.83. So because a not equals to test includes less thans and greater thans, left tail and right tail, we can find the area of the left tail because we got the number from this step 10 from our test statistics. So find the area to the left here. All right. We also need to find the area to the right of positive 4.83, but we know through symmetry those areas are the same. Right? And that's what I was trying to reference before, that when you have a two-tailed test, you find one of the tails, whether it's the left or right, but double it for symmetry because the area under the curve is going to be the same whether you're on the left, version, left tail or the right tail. So what this means for your p-value is for step 11, we're going to say p-value. Right? And we're going to say probability with some stuff in parentheses. Okay. Now you owe me a letter, a symbol, and a number. Actually, I'm gonna write this a little bit lower so it doesn't run into step 10. I'm gonna make sure it's all in view. Okay, so for step 11, you owe me a p-value. Again, probability. We owe a letter. What letter is it? It's the Z. Okay, what symbol? You have to choose less than or greater than. Okay, and here's how you decide. If your z-score is negative, which it is from step 10, go to the left, so use a less than. Use your number from step 10. And here's the kicker. Because this is two-sided, you will multiply this number by two you will double it for symmetry. I will not only get the area under the, uh, to the left of that calculated z-score, but I will also include the greater than version, and I will just double for symmetry. So what this means is on my calculator, I'm gonna do two times normal CDF. And then we're gonna go low, high, mean, standard deviation. All right, so there's a fun little quirk when you have a two-sided test. When you have a two-sided test, you will be doubling your p-value number. You'll always double for symmetry, okay? And how you decide whether you have a less than or greater than symbol here is based on your test statistic. If it's negative, this would be less than. If for some reason I had crunched this and it was positive 4.83, this would have been a greater than. I still would have doubled it for symmetry because it's two-sided. Two-sided tests have a two over here. All right, so let's see what this number is equal to. Okay, so this time I'm gonna do two times my normal CDF. My low was negative one, E99. My high was negative 4.83. My mean was zero and my deviation or my standard deviation was one. And what is my p-value? It's about 1.37. And again, please don't tell me that the p-value, that some probability is 1.37. It can't be 1.37. Probabilities have to be numbers between zero and one, and I can't tell you how many times I get students forgetting the e to the negative six. This p-value is basically zero, all right? We're saying that, hey, if the owners are telling the truth, if really 80% of these fish meet the length, then what's the likelihood I would have this bad of a day that I would get a sample proportion of 53%. Oh, you can't see that number. So let me point to the right things. If the owners were telling the truth and it was true that 80% of the bass met the length, 
What was the probability, what's the likelihood that I would have such a bad day and only have 53% meet the minimum length requirement? That would never happen by chance. It would never happen by random variation, which is enough evidence for us to say, hey, lake owners, you are straight up lying to me. Now, in step 13, you need to make your decision, okay? You owe me a sentence about the null, and you owe me a sentence about the alternate. Your sentence about the null should tell me whether you're gonna reject it or fail to reject it, and your sentence about the alternate should tell me if you have evidence for it or not. So let's figure this out, all right? So our p-value, was it less than alpha or was it greater than alpha? And it's always comparing step 11 and four. This was the numbers for the last problem. Let's see, what were our numbers here? Oh, they actually are the same. So our p-value is still zero and our alpha level was still 0.05. So since our p-value is less than alpha, we're gonna reject h naught. And that also means we have sufficient evidence for the alternate. So let's see what we got here. So this is, again, this is all just part A. We still got parts B and C to do. So let me move this up, okay? And let's see what we got here. So for 13, I would say because our p-value is less than alpha, we reject h naught. Okay, so we're rejecting it. I don't think it's true. Uh, I'm gonna go in favor of the alternate. Now, because we're rejecting H naught, we have sufficient evidence for the alternate. And I don't want you to write 4HA, I want you to put it into context, which is why I put that here. Summarize in context discussing the alternate. So we're gonna say we have sufficient evidence, but I'm not gonna write for HA, I'm gonna write what the alternate is. So the alternate, according to my work, is that P does not equal 80%. So we have sufficient evidence that the true proportion of bass that meet the minimum length requirement is not 80%, or is different from 80%. So let me write that sentence. We have sufficient evidence that the true proportion of bass that meet the, and I'm gonna go length requirement, is not 80%. Or you could say is different from 80%. Or you could say is different from the owner's claims. All of those are, are great sentences to write. But basically, I think the owners are lying. That's what my data supports. That's the evidence that I have. Now, if I was gonna go crunch all of this on my calculator, right, the, the real way, and, and remember I said take a leap of faith with negative 4.83, I always use my calculator to get me to my end answer sooner rather than later. So, so what I mean by that is actually before I do any of my write-up when I'm doing a stats proof, I use technology to tell me what my answer would be. So I'm gonna go down to one sample proportion Z test. Again, anytime you see the word prop, you're talking about proportion. Uh, for some reason in proportion land, they actually distinguish one and two samples. And when we get to mean land, they don't put the ones here. I wish they did, but they don't. All right, so now my hypothesized proportion was 80%. These next two numbers have to be whole numbers. So I had 21 successes out of 51 trials, and I had a not equals to test. So when I go down and I hit calculate, you're seeing there's my negative 4.83. There's my p-value that is not 1.36, it is zero. Please don't forget the e to the negative six, all right? We gotta make sure that we're paying attention to that. So we got all of that. I could also have gone through this and asked my calculator to draw this for me, and you're gonna see it draw, wait for it, it's gonna take it a little while. There's the standard normal curve, centered at zero, standard deviation one, two, three, right? Negative one, two, three. You can't even see negative 4.831 because it's so far off to the left here, but there is some symmetry happening and we've got our p-value is basically zero, okay? So again, I think the owners are lying. Okay, now, I've, I've talked about, or I mentioned how 
two-sided tests are equivalent to confidence intervals. So let's talk about how I would have constructed this confidence interval. I want to go back and do a chapter eight type problem right now. Now in chapter eight, if we were going to run a hypothesis, excuse me, if we were going to create a confidence interval, the first thing we would have done was checked our assumptions. And our assumptions are essentially the same here. The only difference would have been, oops, let me get those into view, is that if we were dealing with assumptions doing confidence intervals, we wouldn't have used P here, we would have used P prime, okay? Because we wouldn't have had the null proportion. So let me go through this. Let's do part B. Let's check our assumptions, all right? So if I was doing part B, I've got some assumptions. So again, I don't know if I have a random sample. That's okay, that's not a deal breaker. Now I'm gonna go NP prime, because if you were doing a confidence interval, you, you wouldn't have had that 80% to go off of. We would have just done NP prime and N1 minus P prime. So if I do 51 times that 53% number, I should get that I had 27 successes in my sample. Right? And then if I do 51 times its complement, I'm gonna find out that I had 24 fish that were failures, right? That did not meet the minimum length requirement. Either way, those are both greater than or equal to 10. All right, I knew my sample size was small relative to my population. I'm gonna take that leap of faith, great. I would, I would go ahead and I'll, I'll write out what kind of confidence interval I'm gonna do. I would have had a one sample proportion, Z star, confidence interval, right? So I've got my assumptions, I'll write here title. The next thing I'm gonna do is actually construct my confidence interval. I know it's been a little while since we did this, but it's statistic plus or minus a margin of error. Your margin of error is always made up of a critical value times a standard error. So let's start crunching these, right? My sample proportion was 53%. My Z star critical value at 95% would be 1.96, right? And I'm saying 95% because that's what I was directed to do was make this confidence interval. All right, and then we've got 53, one minus 53. My sample size, what was it? 51. All right, so there I am making my confidence interval. And again, I'm gonna use technology. I don't, I don't wanna deal with this. So let's go make this confidence interval. All right, if you remember our intervals, same menu, but we gotta scroll down, right? We're starting at the sevens. Same deal, I'm in proportion land, so let's look for the props. There they are. So let me head up to proportion. All right, and because I ran the hypothesis test, my calculator actually remembers my successes and my sample size. So you see it defaults to 27 and 51. I gotta be careful, because I only want a 95% confidence interval. Let me go down and hit calculate. It looks like it's about 39 to, ooh, the devil's number. We got 666, so let's do, this is 0.392, and then 0.666, okay. And just to remind yourself, what number is right here in the middle, right? If I was gonna make an x-axis, right, of sample proportions, if we've got 0.392 and 0.666, what number is always dead in the middle? Well, that is 53%, okay? So don't, remember, don't forget that from last chapter. Okay, we're getting there. Huh. We still gotta interpret it, okay? So if I wanna interpret, I would say we are 95% confident that P, the true proportion of bass that meet the minimum length requirement is between, what are our numbers? It looks like 39.2% and 66.6%, okay? So there's my confidence interval. 
okay, so I've got my hypothesis test, the new stuff from chapter nine. I've got my confidence interval, the old stuff from chapter eight, and that's parts A and B respectively. Okay, so now let's look at C, because this is me trying to connect these two things. And I say connect these two things. How do I connect a two-sided hypothesis test with a two-sided confidence interval? And I say two-sided because if we had drawn the confidence interval graph, right? if I had drawn the confidence interval graph, I would have had like the middle 95% and there would have been two tails onto it. Okay, so how does this work? We actually have the same conclusion. So based on your confidence interval, I'm not sure if I can get these in in the same view screen. Let me see. Can we get the 80 in? Oh, we can't quite do it. So I want you to remember, do we think P, actually I'm gonna write it, I'll write it um, in the same view screen so that we can talk about it. All right, so this problem's so large, I can't get it all in the same view screen. So here's what I mean by that. I want us to compare H naught, P equaling 80%, and HA, P does not equal 80%, okay? I want us to compare this. Based on this confidence interval, what do we think is true, ho or ha? Do I think that the true proportion is 80% or do I think the true proportion is different from 80%? Well, if we look at this, what do I think the true proportion is? I think it's between 39 and 66%. So do I think it's 80%? I don't. 80% is not in my confidence interval. I want you to take note, right? 80% is not in there. I think P, right, I think the true proportion is somewhere between 39.2 and 66.6. .6. So I would reject H naught and say that was evidence for the alternate. Right? It's the same conclusion. So because 80% is not in our confidence interval, our confidence interval also gives us evidence that the, the owner is lying, right? So again, take a look, 80% not in our confidence interval, it's yet more proof, and it's really the same proof that the lake's owners are not telling the truth, okay? So let me put for part C, because 80% is not in our confidence interval, that's key, because it's not in our confidence interval, we have evidence to reject the owner's claim. So confidence intervals give you the same conclusion as hypothesis tests, as long as, there's a lot of as long as. All right, as long as you have a two-sided alternate, which we did, right? So if I go here, right, we had a not equals to, you have to have a not equals to for it to relate to a confidence interval. There is a way to get one-sided tests to relate, but I'm not gonna talk about that in this class. The other key thing is, this was alpha being 5%, and this had to then be a 95% confidence interval. All right, that's one of the other key relationships. If this is 5%, you have to go with the 95% confidence interval, so the cutoffs are the exact same. These two numbers have to add up to 100%. Because on the alpha, you're looking at the two tails, and on the confidence interval, you're looking at the middle 95%. So these are the two tails that are 2.5% on the side, this is the middle 95%. So those, those two numbers have to add up to 100%. So for example, if this, let's say, and I know it wasn't, but let's say this was 2% alpha, this would have then had to be a 98% confidence interval, okay? If this was a, I don't know, let's go with a 10% alpha, because that's a pretty common one, this would have had to be a 90% confidence interval. So whatever your alpha level is, its complement has to be the confidence level. So 10%, 90%, 5%, 95%, 1%, 99%. I'm gonna rewrite the correct numbers, and then I wanna talk about how I differ from the greater stats community. Okay, so the correct numbers were 5%, 95%. All right, how do I differ from the greater stats community? I personally love confidence intervals. It gives me so much more information. All this told me was that it wasn't 80%, okay? But this confidence interval gave me way more. It actually told me not only was it not 80%, it was somewhere between 39.2 and 66.6, .6, right? I got the estimate here. 
So the real world is obsessed with hypothesis tests. I will always run a confidence interval. I actually think the write-ups are easier and they give you more information. All right, so with that, we're gonna pop over to Meanland and try that one out. I'll see you in a few, bye.